My name's Tony Sabanskis, writer, filmmaker, inventor of the H card, and world-renowned music constructionist. Famed for my extensive research with the, and of course, as chief technical officer on Baseline. Now put a donk on it. The Electro. Put a donk on it. This week, our special guest is none other than the spectacularly fabulous. It's a shambles. It? Okay then, let's not waste any more time. Sit back and get ready for the highly informative, hugely entertaining, borderline annoying Custard Room Podcast! Thanks. For all our listeners, all our millions of listeners that we've got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa's female. I didn't want that to confuse anybody, so I'll just get that out straight away. What's that meant to mean? Well, we've just had a lot of male guests Sound on. Sounds a bit like Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've had a lot of male guests on. So if you'd just like to introduce yourself, what you do. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm Lisa Ryan Carter. I'm um, a senior lecturer at University of Bolton in film editing, and I still work as a film editor. Is, documentary is, editor, really. So a documentary film? Mostly, but I did do a drama last year. Right. Is Ryan your middle name? No, it's uh, part of my surname and it's not posh. It's what my dad took after leaving Borstal to lose his criminal record. Oh, was it? Yes. Yeah, right. I always thought you were sort of brought up quite middle class. Well, you know, it depends how you define middle class, doesn't it? Not quite wealthy. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we weren't quite wealthy. We were quite poor. Your brother's quite famous as well, isn't he? Well, in the in the sort of sound sound world. Well, I don't know about famous. He's yeah, had. Yeah, I'd uh, say he's famous. Yeah, well, you like that. Sort he was of... he was my hero when I was growing up. What you, you mean? You listen to Lucid? Yeah, no, uh, uh, the famous Gross music. Oh right, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always wanted to know he made that. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, and if you child. listen to the uh, the Tesco advert, there's a kind of remarkable similarity. Yeah. Oh, is that? Da 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 da. da. So you know, the story's da, da, not. Da, 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 da. No, they both they did the both the same. They're both done by Adam. Oh right, right, right. Go on, who's your brother? Adam Ryan Carter. Right, right. And he and he did the music for the famous Grouse. Yeah, and he was in a. He had a band called Lucid. Who he, he also did. We buy in a car dot com, didn't he? Yes. Oh yeah. dear me. Dear and me. Crusher. Oh, did he do Crusher? Yeah, Crusher. Yeah. That's him singing Crusher. Oh no way. Yeah. Mm. See all these famous people that you uh, get to get to know. Well, that you know quite well, really. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's famous. I would. He did get to number two <laughs> in the hit parade with a with a with an actual track or with a jingle. With a with an actual track, <laughs> a cover version actually of um, more than this. A cover version of Mash Get Smashed. <laughs> <laughs> Roxy Music. More right, than right, this. right. Oh, that's all right, though, isn't mm. it? Right, so. Explain <laughs> what you do as far as you said you're a documentary editor. Okay, well, these days I do quite a lot of independent documentaries. Uh, well, not quite a lot, actually, maybe one a year. Um, and that's because I've got a full-time job teaching and documentary takes up a hell of a lot of time. So um, I did one about a year and a half ago about uh, the Sicilian Mafia with a director called Paul Sapin. Um so he brings all the footage to me and between us we kind of find the story and put it together and yeah would you say if you would, like would say that documentary for instance do you follow a structure like with drama like um you know like um like a three act the hero of, journey or fine. like the Blake Schneider thing um sort of sometimes i mean you do need to find you know beginning middle end sort of thing um Depends what you're doing. Quite often, if you're following a character, you know you you, you want some kind of development or find turning points um, or you know changing points and that sort of thing. You know, it's it's about documentary, it's about revelation. So yeah, you do find a structure. It's not necessarily um, as simple as the not simple, but you know, you're not. Well, you can follow a list. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's more free flow. You just. The structure will come out once you know the story itself. It depends. I mean, sometimes you've got a director who does have a structure in mind, although with Paul and that programme, it changed quite a bit. And we had a problem in that it didn't end because the trial 
didn't end within the time frame of our film, so we right. had quite an open ending, and we struggled really to know what we were going to do to end it. Right, right. And also, you know, you struggle to know how much backstory to put in and what's important. And um, yeah, because I mean, with that type of documentary, where that can be structured from the start, really, can't it? Because you'll know the segments that you're going to put in, like the backstory or what. But say, you have you ever worked on a documentary where? The filmmaker or the the, cam- the crew have been following people and they've not known. So a, a, a type of documentary that starts with you not knowing what these people who you're following yeah. are actually going to do. Have you worked on one of them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've worked on all sorts of things. Like, so you get those kind of observational ones where, yeah. and they film a lot of stuff just on spec. And, yeah. And, um, yeah, that's always like we did. Although it's not quite, we don't quite know what's going to happen. But we, I did a series about Accrington Stanley. <laughs> couple of years ago. Oh, the, the famous um, football team. Yeah, the very famous football <laughs> team. It was when they got back in the football, you know, football league. Back uh, up into the third, third division. Something like that, yeah. No, but it was. it's interesting because they did it just on merit, no money right. or anything from yeah, know, yeah. being kind of amateur. Um, so it was a series about that and there was loads of... Um, Loads and loads of kind of just roaming around footage for that. So we had to find a structure that went across six programmes right. plus each programme. Uh, and that one was quite interesting. But we tried to put a match in each programme. Right. So that gives us a structure of whether they won or lose. It's something to work to. And yeah. It just provided us a framework. Sometimes what you need is a kind of framework or a vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you watch many documentaries? Yeah. Have you been watching the ones on said uh, the... Like Wild Wild Country, uh, Making a Murderer, okay. all them type of... Yeah, um, although I've not had chance or time to watch much at all recently. But yeah, and I like the idea that you can tell stories over a really long time frame because getting enough information in is, yeah. is often a real problem. The way that they did it with Making a Murderer, one episode, you thought, he's guilty. Then the second episode, they'd introduced something else where you thought he was being set up by the coppers mm. and you're going, he's been set up. Third episode, oh no, he's guilty fourth episode oh no it's someone else and it was just like that for the 10 you know while you watched it I thought you were a bit dragged out though um, mm-hmm. in, in general it was probably two programmes too long yeah I'd say I'd say a bit more than two as well I think they could have squashed that into a big film uh, really yeah you've Maybe. not seen it yes I've seen it yeah oh right right right, right. Uh, I quite like I don't know if you've heard Serial I thought that was quite interesting in terms of the way yeah, that so that's the structured. audio yeah. round, yeah. I've not, you know what, I've not heard it and I've been recommended it. It's, um, that did it start off quite a long time ago and then yeah. they've just done a new one recently? Yeah, probably. And right. that, that, I think, um, has a similar sort of, you know, he's guilty, he's not guilty. They've started doing it a lot with dramas. Yeah. Um, as in the same principle, you know, you're watching 10 episodes, one one episode it'll be, oh, oh it's the dad, next one, oh, no, it's the mum, next one, oh, no, it's the son. And you go all along. But I've worked them out now. All it is is you just wait. The person who has had the least screen time, it's them. So you can just watch, watch all 11 and I'll guess like, who it is before the end. I don't know if you ever watched Casualty, but the first person you saw who wasn't a usual staff member oh, yeah, was going to yeah. die. Yeah, oh, well, that's the thing with the... Well, they used to label them up on Star Trek, though. They used to give them the um, red jacket, didn't they? Oh, oh, don't know. All the people with red jackets on were the ones that were going to die in every episode. Poor sods. Um, so, as a f- freelance... A free class is freelance, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I did a lot of freelance before, before teaching, as well. What well, uh, in documentary editing? Yeah. Yeah. You started off with film though, as well, didn't you? Chopping, splicing film. I was an assistant film editor at right. BBC. Right. Yeah. And were you actually spliced physical yeah. film? Physically spliced film. That must be hard work. No, not at all. No. Why? Why would it be hard work? Well, it's not like pulling it's, pints. If it's digital, what, what pulling pints is hard work. Well, you no. are middle class, you aren't you? Have you never pulled pints? No, it's not as hard work as pulling pints. All oh, right. Yeah, no, I don't think that's hard. I don't think. Well, that's what I'm saying. Work. It's not hard work. Oh, I mean, right. it's not. It's hard brain work in the same way, but it's not hard physical work, is it? So, say before you were lecturing. Yeah. You were obviously in the industry doing freelance editing. Yeah. Yeah. How did it start? Right, so I did my first degree in fine art, film, video, photography, performance and sound, although I didn't do any performance. Mm. Um, and after I left uni, 
it was a long time ago, so unemployment was very popular and uh, so were schemes like the extra tenor, you know. Oh, ET. Yeah, ET. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I spent a long time doing arty nonsense uh, with no money whatsoever, you know, and oh, living like. on benefits and cashing on jobs. In a bed set? Shared house, yeah. <laughs> had an absolutely fantastic time. But I sort of realised that I kind of needed to uh, possibly grow up a little bit at some point. So when I was a, about 29, I, just, I applied to do an MA. And technology was changing. I'd got a bit of work yeah. um, doing bits and pieces of VHS editing for right. commercials usually and um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, corporate video. Right. And I get paid like 100 to 150 pounds a day, which was great at the time. Yeah, yeah. But technology was starting to change, non-linear editing was coming in. Um, oh, and also I'd been doing the um assistant film editing at the BBC. Right. And I did that straight out of college, but it was getting harder to get that work and technology was changing there as well. So yeah. some of it was going towards video editing. Um Avid was starting to come in and light works. Right. So I wanted to get into that just so I could keep my uh, freelance earnings up just doing the corporate video. So I s signed on at Salford to do the MA in TV and documentary. Um, and I was going to actually go as a director at the time, but um, right. I got in as a director and they persuaded me to do editing because they'd taken on too many people as directors. Right. And it was probably the best thing I ever did was change to be an editor because... Um, I learned how to use Avid. I only cut two documentaries that were put out on television. Right. And from the minute I finished, I was working full-time as a freelance editor. And at the same time, I set up a small business with a guy called Jim Mooney, which was a very small uh, post-production editing facility. Because at the time, right. um, non-linear editing suites cost about £30,000 to buy. Right. So we rented a couple and put them in this thing and uh, made almost no profit for a while. Uh, but anyway, it worked out and now he's really rich and I'm just a lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> so did he, he continued? Yeah, he continued. Do you still speak to him? Yeah, it's, yeah, I still speak to him. Can you ask him for some money? Well, <laughs> oh, it's a long story. Oh, right. We, we lost the premises. Right, right. And uh, at the same time I was pregnant and we just parted company at that point because um, I wanted to go and edit documentaries that's all I wanted I didn't want to run a business right he wanted to make adverts and right 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 well if you changed from so what got you into you because it's obviously someone else's influence that got you interested in in editing if you wanted to be a director originally <sighs> Have you, have, have, were you one of these that sort of watched films as a kid and sort of grew up wanting to be a director or was it just something mm -hmm. that you thought, no, I'm going to have to do something uh, arty? I came at it from kind of artiness and I was doing video art, you know, um, uh, kind of doing lots of um, installation stuff and projection stuff. Oh, right, yeah. It was quite good fun. We did the history of the world in 19 minutes, oh, right. projected yeah, on yeah, a massive, right. great big building. Yeah, all yeah. oh, right. I thought, I thought you were like one of them. I've walked into a room once where it was just white. All the walls were white, and they had one screen on, and it was playing some nonsense, yeah. like some art film. It was terrible. Probably got paid a fortune to make it. Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, yeah. So I came at it from that direction, but and I wanted to direct, I think. I did want to direct, but I'm quite shy. Right. And I struggled to tell people what to do quite a lot of the time so I, su I suppose when you when you're on low budget independence and things that's quite important when you, i mean bigger budgets doesn't really matter does it because mm. you just get your ad to do it or whoever and also i'm not great on ideas right. and um i was waiting around for all these fantastic ideas to happen but actually what i do found i did like was kind of the collage aspect of editing you know right. you're making something it's like a collage and so you don't necessarily have to be the ideas person well, I think with, with especially with the type of documentary where you've just got a big load of footage mm -hmm. and there was no sort of initial plan with it, the work or the, the actual art in it and the structure and the story and everything else is in the edit. Mm. You know, rather than, I mean, the, the director might have got some good shots and everything, but they're just it's just a collection mm. of shots I more than anything. Definitely with a Tony Benn film, that was... 
Oh, right, yeah, you did the Tony Penn documentary, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, that was how that was approached, having to find a kind of structure in that. Because they'd done one main interview and a couple of audio interviews. Yeah. Um, and actually, Tony was kind of declining relatively rapidly. Right. Uh, so I had to find a, a structure for that. That was quite difficult. And so it ended up being this kind of, you know, his his kind of past life and childhood, what he'd learnt from that and what he wanted to kind of pass on. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And his thoughts on mortality and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, you said you worked on some adverts with the, on VHS. Uh, initially, yeah. Uh, electricity oh, board and <laughs> the electric- Norweb, was yeah. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, that, that was back in the day then, isn't that it? That was really back in the day. Um, I can't really remember any of the ones. A lot of corporate video as well. And right. inserts for morning breakfast TV. Right. Uh, you know, like a, yeah. Right, right. If you freelance, I've found it's quite difficult when you get the work to actually get people to pay. Have you ever been ripped off? No. You've never been ripped off? No. Well, that's good then, isn't it? Yeah. And that was quite quick. <laughs> <laughs> but I worked, so initially I was working at a company called Vector. Um, that was a lot of VHS editing initially. And then a bit. Vector always always paid. Although when you say, come to think of it, Vector went under and they did owe me 60 quid. Oh, right. But that's right. nothing really in the scheme oh, of things. I, I, it might have been quite a lot back in the day, though. Wasn't that's like equivalent to about three grand though, isn't it? It wasn't that far back in the day, <laughs> Tony. Um, <laughs> And then after that, a lot of what we did, what I did was for Granada and right. ITV, so they don't tend to rip you off. Uh, so even though you were freelance, it was working for big companies sort of thing? Quite a lot of the time, yeah. Right, right, right. All right. Um, what was the money like? Oh, the money's good. Hmm? Editing, it's good. It's relatively good. But then, you know, uh, on some things I've been worked like, you know, they own your life. Yeah. Um, I think when you're in your kind of early 30s that yeah. you can kind of get a kick out of that in a way uh the kind of you know i don't, I don't know the kind of uh not the pressure or the stress it's just it's quite nice the buzz the adrenaline is quite nice sometimes it's quite good fun but um do you think to get the deadline but do you think it's still the same now probably yeah as in you've got students yeah yeah so you've got 15 students yeah. That's probably three times what you've really got. <laughs> but when they go out into the big bad world, I know that you recommend, you know, if they are good editors, that they do go out and sort of try and get this freelance editing work. But with, like you say, with the change in technology, things are a lot like, more accessible. It's easy for someone to go and buy a laptop now that can edit quite, you know, quite well on, on whatever software package. So it's become easier for people to get hold of the equipment to use in the first place. So a lot more people will be doing it. That's true. Uh, uh, I suppose what I'm thinking about is the kind of work that I did is quite... It's quite specialist and it's quite high-end. So you're talking about people who um, need somebody yeah. to craft it and to put something together. Right. Um, then you know those those sort of directors that I work with are not necessarily going to edit their own film. Yeah. They're never going to do it. Apart from the fact that quite a lot of them are, you know, a bit long in the tooth to learn yeah, the technology, yeah, yeah. which seems really odd these days because everybody can use a computer, but they just don't want to get their head around them. And you yeah. know, th- there is a kind of one of the changes is the safety net that working in a a post-production house or a broadcast environment gives you so as a freelance editor you're quite a lot more responsible for quite a lot of technical standards and you know they don't want anything to do with that yeah fair enough is there any students that have actually gone out and sort of become editors professional editors um i don't know i don't know i mean sometimes it takes quite a long time to achieve kind of professional editing status yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really. I can I can imagine it being quite an unsociable job as well. It, as in, it you can sat be. on your own most of the time, aren't you, in, in, in dark rooms? You sat with a director quite a lot of the time. I mean, who has, with documentary quite a lot of the time, there's a division of labour between the editor and the director, and a lot of what I did was specialist factuals, which is science and history. Right. So they're coming and they have 
to write um, uh, a commentary. And they might have written one at the start, but it never works and they have to keep doing it over and over again. Yeah. And so there is a division of labour and you're kind of cutting it and putting it together and they're trying to write more commentary and work it out. So it's it's very collaborative. It's uh, ever fallen out with the director? Very rarely. And I used to argue with Sanjay, who was the director of the Tony Ben Project, but I think he used to like arguing. Right, right. Um, and, yeah, I think he used to treat it as a kind of sport. So rather than arguing over a certain point, he just wanted to pick at things? Or... Yeah, he just wanted to have a bit of a row for a laugh. Right. <laughs> have you worked with him since? No, but he's not done anything since. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> Where did it go, the Tony Ben film? Uh... Won the Audience Award at the Edinburgh Film Festival. All oh, right, right, cool. Um, it went into cinemas all over the country. I never saw it. Well, <laughs> doesn't mean it wasn't there. <laughs> you, it's documentaries to go into the cinema is a rare thing, anyway. Yeah, it's about, well, even more so now. Yeah, you know, it, did, with... it did festivals worldwide, and right. it won in various places. Are you talking about independent sort of cinemas? Yeah, right. They did a lot of screenings as well in communities because. Um, Sanjay had a few quid and he could afford to subsidise that a bit so right. we did one in Manchester Town Hall which was really nice they did you know up in um, Northumberland right. uh, Durham Miners that sort of thing God have you won any awards? That, has it won any awards? have you won any awards? not specifically for editing but no. I've worked on a lot of films that um that have won awards have won awards of which I think the editing is a contribution yeah, of course well, especially documentaries yeah. yeah, so Dockers won the RTS Award. Writing the Wrongs, sometimes they use Always it. Always Dockers. Jimmy McGovern wrote a film about the striking Dockers in Liverpool and we made a documentary about the process. I remember, yeah. I think yeah. I might have seen that one, actually. Sometimes people use it in their teaching about writing because it does show Jimmy McGovern and sometimes Irving Walsh a bit sort of teaching writing. Right. So that, yeah. Aquinas and Stanley won the Best Sports Programme RTS and Best... Regional doc. All right, good, yeah. good. Uh, Have you ever worked with any big directors? Terrence well, big, da- big names. Sorry. Terence Davis. All right, yeah. Sally Potter. Who's ter- who, what was his name? Terence. Terence Davis. He he, wrote, he directed um, Distant Voices, Still Lives, and The Long Day Closes. Um, recently, he's done Sunset Song and the film about Emily Dickinson. I think it's called The Quiet Place, a film called The Deep Blue, film with What's Her Face from... Um, the X-Files. Hang on, let's talk about The Quiet Place. Is that the one where it's in sign language? No. It's, right. it's about um, a poet, Emily Dickinson. I'm not. It might not even be called The Quiet Place. Right, I can't right, even right, remember. Right. But it's about the American poet, Emily Dickinson. Ah, right, right. Yeah, no, it's not the same one. I think there is another film called The Quiet Place. Yeah, it might not even be called that. But right. anyway, I've worked with him on yeah. A Time in the City, which did really well. And uh, it came higher in the New York film and TV critics list than District 9, one place higher, which I think was actually a bad decision on their part. District 9, the... Yeah. Refresh my memory. The one where it's... Well, the, the one aliens. where... Yeah, the aliens in the trash. In, like a, in, like South, in Africa, virtually South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. Ra, 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 ra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, it, it got a higher place than that. Yeah, which I think is a total mistake. I don't know. Uh, mm. He's not done much after that, though, has he? Who? The, the director of um, District 9. He did that thing, was it called... It was Turd. The one in... With what's Matt Damon in space, with no, part of the same... No, no, um, what's he called? The It's another kind of alien kind of thing. He's got a name like Chappie, that's it. Oh, he did, ch- yes, with the um, yeah. them rappers. Yeah. Um, have you seen them rappers doing the in the music video? No. The, honestly, it's really good. Um, yeah, I can't remember what they're called. But yeah, South African rappers, aren't they, who, who star in it? I don't know who they are. Yeah, you know the weirdos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're basically South African rappers. But they've done, uh, they did one, uh, Butterfly, I think it's called. It's quite good. Right. It, it was massive on, you know, a massive hit, really, basically. Right, so what, what do you think your best work is? Probably the Tony Benn project. Uh, although I had a bit of a fallout with. Sanjay towards the end because he wanted to change some things and I think that's what because he wanted to stamp his authority on it because I think he felt like I'd it was my fault you know I'd taken it right, over right. a bit yeah yeah 
And so he made some decisions which, which I don't like. And which, which stuck? Yeah, because it's his money, you know, he's, he's right, going right. to you know, do it yeah. anyway. So I, you know, yeah, there are things about that film that I don't necessarily agree with. Right. But, uh, yeah, I like that film. Where, where's, your, where's your influences come from? What are your favourite documentaries? I could never remember names. There was a brilliant one about the Rivonia 10, who are the people who, um, uh, you know, did the, um, you know, Nelson Mandela and his lot. All it was right, a yeah. brilliant, brilliant about documentary apartheid. about that. Yeah. I mean, I love a lot of the Storyville stuff and the documentaries that have been on that. Uh, there's a, I mean, there's a lovely documentary called The Lost Boys of Sudan, which um, is very lacks a lot of dialogue it's visually just beautiful uh, I think that's true stories um, Orson Welles' F for Fake I thought was wonderful it's not a documentary though is it kind of is in a way mm. is it mm. is it not all been planned or has it was it I, I, I'm a right it's, it's about an art forgery it's a sort false of. documentary it's about, about yeah, it's about uh, fakery, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I got confused watching it, to be honest. Arena, a lot of Arena documentaries that right. um, have been on. I loved Arena, uh, and so that's been a big influence for me. That was like um, like Storyville, like a set that of different sort of documentaries that were sort of yeah, forces under one label. Yeah, it's very label. much kind of curated and uh, commissioned by a guy called Anthony Wall, who had a very good kind of vision for it so right. stuff that he did there was like a um, film called Wisconsin Death Trip which I, I just love it's beautiful right um, what's the British guy called um, Nick Nick Fraser no um, Nick Broomfield Broomfield do you not like his films yeah I do like his films um, I like particularly his, his early one the um, uh, what do you call it the leader his driver and his driver's wife yes yeah. Which I think is one of his best ones. I'm getting done from the library. Thirty pound fine I got for taking that out and never bringing I, it. I back. took it out, but I brought it back. The only thing it did, they didn't break the seal on the DVD. Right. So when I got it home, I had to smash the case open to get the DVD out. So I put it in a normal case and posted it, but it mustn't have scanned mm. because I think the scans in the actual seal. So yeah, they're trying to sting me up thirty pound. I said, I know him. Mm. I'll just go in and say, Duncan, it's all right. <laughs> That'd be fine. Errol Morris as well. Errol Morris. Yeah, he made um, oh, uh, what do you call it? Um, Fog of War and Tabloid and loads of other things. Really love Errol Morris. Right. It's a thin blue line. You always uh, recommend Nanook of the North to your students. No, I don't. But... Yeah, you do. You did to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. But actually, it is worth a, a bit of a watch, probably. I've oh, never watched it all the way through. Oh, my God. You recommend it and you've not even I watched it. I don't actually wa recommend The Nuke of the North. I, I don't. I know I don't. I kind of recommend Lindsay Anderson sometimes because Lindsay Anderson's barking mad and I really like what he did in Oh, Dreamland and stuff. Well, I mean, it's just it's interesting and mad and quite disturbing. Right. Oh, right. You like disturbing documentaries. No, but I think in terms of just trying to, you know, think a bit creatively, sometimes it's yeah. good to watch things that are a bit, you know, Towards the edge, right? A bit, bit thinking outside the box sort of yeah. documentaries, like mine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I remember when I was, I was doing. Um, it was a plan B. We were in teams mm. doing a film, and I can't remember whose team I was in. Like it had been dumped with five random students, who I knew we weren't going to get anything done. So I planned a like a, a side one because it was getting marked. And I got a parking ticket that day as I was thinking, yeah. oh, what can I do as a, you know, some I like idea your like. parking ticket, Phil. At the time, you didn't. I remember all I got from you at the time were, why are you spending so much fucking time on this documentary? You could have paid the bleeding parking <laughs> ticket off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember I, that being the top cut. I, I, I should have put that on the uh, on a cover of it. <laughs> I use that documentary actually in teaching sometimes. I know, well, because I you're that guy off that documentary, aren't you? Like, because yeah, yeah. I think it's a really good example about how you can make quite an entertaining film out of virtually out of nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I, I've done that quite a few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pulse of it. Your speciality. Bolton and Story World was an ideal sort of thing where they had all that rubbish footage. Mm. It was like, my God, what are we going to do with this? So I created the cameraman. As yes. an actual character yeah. and did the voiceovers and everything. And yeah. he just turned it around, really, from that, that sort of um, 
Well, all that rubbish footage that I we know, actually because it was painful to watch, wasn't it? <laughs> Absolutely painful. Which Bolton won an award for. Yes. Well, whoever made it got an award for. Well, I think there was a whole re repurposing, I think, re-edit that went on over the summer, which I think you were involved in with Ashok and uh, yeah, yeah, Lee. Yeah, yeah we, we edited, I edited personally, 15 short episodes and 60 little videos of like this granular content for just random things like we'd go and film like the marketplace and put it on for the map. So we'd done loads and loads over uh, the state of about a week. Crazy, crazy sort of... Um, Amount of well, the workload was was a bit of killer. Right. Yeah, I didn't get it. I didn't even get paid. Were you supposed to get paid? No, I did. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way I would have done it if I hadn't. <laughs> We're going to do our little section now, our fru- frugal filmmaker section. Okay. Are you ready for me, Ident? Yeah. Yes, folks, you guessed it. It's time for your favorite part of the show. It's the frugal filmmaker segment. Enjoy. Right, so frugal filmmaking. Mm-hmm. This can be anything, yeah? Yeah. This could be wrapping a pair of tights around a court hanger and creating uh, a popper stopper, like they do at Bolton University, or, you know, anything that you can think of. Mm. Okay. Uh, we created quite a lot of nice effects for a music video by with the... Um, use of Vaseline, not on straight on the lens, but a piece of glass in front of it. All right, yeah. Um, like a smoky effect? Yeah, kind of like a... It just plays around with the focus a bit and blurs did you, out. Did you take that from Star Wars? I don't know. George Lucas did it. Did on, he? Uh, yeah, you know the... I can't remember what the transport's called in the first one, where Luke's in his little... Right at the start of the film, virtually, where yeah. he's in his little transport and it's going along. You could see the the actual machine that was moving it, or the wheels or something underneath. So he ended up putting just a strip of Vaseline on the lens. Just to blur it out. Just to blur the bit, <laughs> bit out at the bottom. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Good yeah. and cheap. Um, I did a video installation one time. Um, Explain what a video installation is, because some of our listeners are a bit thick. Okay, this uh, this one was based on the theory... Uh, oh, it's, it was about a swimming pool, in a way. So it, when you watched it, it was like looking in the inside of a swimming pool from uh, the viewing window at the side. Right. So it was projected onto three sides of a cube, like, all, like not a cube, like a swimming pool shape. Right. And on, underneath the bottom, we had this kind of, um, it was like a baking tray with a bit of water in it just to give you a bit of a watery effect with the light shining on it. How big was the swimming pool? Well, it was, it was about as big as this room, which you can't see. It, it was to do with being able to get the, Projectors far enough back to give you the impression of the ah, size right, of it. Right. And also the projections gave you an impression of the size of it. it the imagery wasn't always about a swimming pool. It changed quite a lot. Right, but right. it had dance in it. And one of the things that I want, did with this dance thing was, um, again, baking tray with some water in it and a, a mirror at the bottom. Right. And I'd reflected a telly in it and I was kicking the baking tray slightly just to shatter the image. And a guy that I used to go to college with who was really, really into technology, and bear in mind this is a long time ago, said, oh, wow, that's a brilliant DVE, which is a digital video effect, and I don't ah, know what right, he was right, talking right, about right. at the time. Yeah. Um, and at the, also at the time, things like that used to cost an absolute fortune. You'd have to go in and use these really powerful computers. And right. I'd just done it with a mirror and a baking, and a baking tray, tray, a bit of water. So... That's, yeah, no, that's, that's good. Yeah, no, that's, you know, well, that that actually works today, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lo-fi filmmaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You like lo-fi filmmaking? Yeah, I do. Though, don't you? I do like lo-fi filmmaking. Do you still use? Because there's a bit of a a community in Manchester mm. that still use the old Super Eight. Yeah, Super Eight tapes and and tapes, film, it's film, film. and yeah. little reels. Uh, yeah, I do quite like a bit of Super I haven't done any for a while because my camera's broken. I just bought a thing that you can stick on to your phone, I think it is, or uh, which uses 35mm film. It's made by the, you know, the Lomo people. So you put something on your... I'm not sure whether you put it on your phone or whether you just use it and then you, you kind of develop the film and then you put it back on your phone to kind of tell it. Digitise it, yeah. right. Oh, know. that's weird. Yeah. Have you used it yet? No. Why? Not at the time. You, why? You're never I'm... in uni. 
<laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm working too hard out of uni. Oh, right. On your other jobs? No, on my uni work. Oh, right, right. You're doing some work. <laughs> oh, it's marking season, though, isn't it? It's always marking season. You've got them three students to mark their work, haven't you? Yep. <laughs> most enjoyable. Have I asked that? No. What was your most enjoyable sort of... Without a doubt, the grape tapes. The grape tapes. The grape tapes, which is a shambolic and overlong documentary about black grape. Oh, the band? Yeah. Ah, right. No, what, what was he like to work with? Uh, well, I didn't really see very much of him, but oh, the director, yeah. Tom Bruggen, is absolutely barking mad. Right. And I think I'm I think about... he'd have to be, wanted to work with him. Yeah. I'm about to, bar- to um, embark on possibly a second version of that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ah, no like way. about well, 20 years later. Probably Not probably. about Black Grape, though. About Mondays. The whole thing, yeah. Right, like, right. But I think the there's an input from the um, people who made the Amy Winehouse and Senna films. Uh I don't S- Senna was massive film. No, it's brilliant, brilliant yeah. film. And Amy, the Amy Winehouse film was. Massive. Not seen that one. Yeah, Not seen. I, I wasn't really into Amy Winehouse, but Senna is, is probably the one. No, but me. you can see a good film, can't you? Like, oh yeah, yeah. Fire in Babylon is an absolutely brilliant film about cricket. I don't like cricket at all. Do you know? I was explaining this to someone the other week. I was saying the more specific you are with the subject, the wider the audience. And a, an example of this, I watched um, a documentary. I think it's Trophy Kids. Something like that. I might be, might be mixed up with the title. But basically it was about kids playing golf and the parents and the way that they treat the kids to get them to, you know... You know what it's like? It's like the dance moms, in it? Mm. So I watched that all the way. I have no interest in golf whatsoever, but I watched that, no problems, and it was a really good film. But if it was about golf, I wouldn't have watched it. You know, if it was just like an open it's subject the characters, like, isn't it? Well, yeah, but it's also more specific it's about children play and I think it's the relationship yeah, between the them and the parents yeah the, the, that was the interesting thing have you always been interested in documentaries or was that just something that you found you were good at well I found I found I was I don't know about good at it but I find it more interesting in terms of editing than drama and I find drama a bit of a grind when you first start putting it together, you know, because you've got a script and you're looking yeah. for the best take. And yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. work kind of starts after you've got the assembly, but with with documentary, it's like digging through a jumble sale, isn't it, you know? Yeah. Um, and also, I don't know, that I think the mental gymnastics are more fun in documentary. And part of me, because I used to do a lot of science and history, right. likes the nerdiness of the science ones, but, you know, trying to tell a good story out of something scientific. Right. Um, well, edu- like educational sort of science? Well, not necessarily educational, but stuff like, um, I mean, it was prime time science, so Secrets of the Dead, you know, those sort of um, Channel 4 kind oh, of. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I did one about the Spanish flu. Right. Uh, I did a whole series called Battlefield Detectives, uh, which was about... I've, I've seen one of them, yeah. Which was about, so they'd take a battle and they'd look at why a certain side lost, you know, like in terms of the topography of the ground or, yes, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. the technology it's of the weapon. Even weaponry. going about the, the, uh, the geography of the country and everything, yeah. all the limitations yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, but you'd have to make it kind of arty and exciting at the same time. So I really yeah. like, I used to really like doing them. I mean, I did a whole series on the history of the warship, which, I mean, <laughs> I really, really don't like, but quite enjoyed editing it. Yeah, yeah. You're quite liberal though, aren't you? Yeah, very. You don't agree with what? No, no, not at all. In any case. In any way, shape, any or, way, form. shape no. or form. Except, you know, you know, na- Nazi well, except for Fal- the yeah. Falklands. No. <laughs> no, I was against that. <laughs> Were you? Yeah. Did you protest? Yeah, probably. I can't remember. You co- Do you protest a lot? Yeah, I'm going to protest against Trump. I'm going to go and... Whatever. I am. Why? Such yeah. a good leader for America. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not think they're suited? They are perfectly matched. Who, the United, America? The United States and Trump. Well, they have. Perfectly matched. Yeah. yeah. Well, did, did, got what they They deserve what they... Yeah, yeah they exactly. really do. Yeah, I hope yeah. they learn a bloody lesson from it before he manages to destroy the world. He'll get in another four years. Well, the frightening thing is he's just such a puppet as well. Yeah. You, the, do you know my theory with that? I know it's, an, it's not a conspiracy theory, this, but with the, with the link with Fox News, Fox News is basically telling him he's sort of um, his policies and everything else yeah he'll he'll watch Fox and then he'll he'll go on next, on Twitter and agree and then sort of pull something very similar but who owns Fox 
and who owns Sky and Fox mm. and no, well, I know it's, it's Rupert Murdoch's his I puppet. Know. He's, well, he's, he's puppet master, I should say. It's, it's always like that. It's horrible. It's just disgusting. I know, I know. Frightening. Would you do a documentary on Trump? Yeah, of course. But when they rang me up to do the Tony Benn thing, yeah. they wouldn't tell me at first who it was. And I, I had to go down to London to meet them. And I was really intrigued, but I thought, if it's Tony Blair, I'm going to have to turn it down. Why? unless they Unless they're kind of doing a real kind of, you know, because I... The fact he really disappointed Things me. Things are going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have used that? I tried <laughs> to get that into the documentary, but I just couldn't get it because it's a really great shot with, um, you oh, know. Brain, brain, uh, oh, brain no, keyboard. What, Mandelson and Blair and oh, all right, that. Right. And, oh, it's just horrible. Oh, I, thought, I thought you meant the, the music video for it. Oh, Brian Cox. The, <laughs> yeah. lo- the lovely Brian Cox. Oh, do you know him? No. Oh, right. Although my friend Maura, who actually probably taught you, yeah. Did a programme with him on time travel. Oh, does she? Yeah. Oh, oh, time travel. He's a bit he's a bit too nice, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. A bit wet. I think he's a Christian. That well, doesn't make him wet. His personality makes him wet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Another question bef- before we move on to the quiz. No. What? I've asked you your best work, haven't I? No. Oh, I've not. All right, go on then. Sorry. <laughs> what was your best work? Well... One of the best things I worked on was Journeys into the Outside with Jarvis Cocker, which was um, three programmes with Jarvis Cocker travelling around the world looking at outsider art. Uh, he's quite he's quite an arty type, isn't he? He is a bit arty, yeah. yeah. I like Jarvis. I like him as well. I don't think he's much good at singing. I think he's a great singer. In Terrible fact, singer. while I was working on that programme, they were still out, when I started, they were still out shooting and they were in France and they rang me up, the production crew rang me up because Jarvis was doing karaoke in a small bar in France and he was singing um, Africa by Toto. Ah, <laughs> in a small know. karaoke bar, so they rang me up and held the phone out so I could listen. So Jarvis doing Africa by Toto yeah. was one of your highlights? Yes, of the production. <laughs> You, you, best work. You said something else before. I'm sure of it. What was the, the other one you said? Did I say the Tony Benn film? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Keep trying to plug that. Well, is it available on Amazon? It, I think it is. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Or iTunes or it something. On, it might so be even free Prime. to watch because you know it's kind of. Uh, it was made by a millionaire who's atoning for being a millionaire. Ah, uh, is that what it were? Well, I think it is. Ah, uh, right, right, right. But he wouldn't let you get your your last say in. No. Ah, uh, so. Sanjay, if you ever listen to this, which he, you won't. He will, he will. He's, bo- he's yeah. bound to, isn't he, eventually? Yeah. No he could maybe um, have a row about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to go into the quiz. Oh, no. Are you ready? Mm. Quiz time! It's time to test your general knowledge in the world of film and production. Quiz time. <laughs> I won't know the answers. You will. You, you'll know a few. I'm going to start off easy, these. Okay. I, ju- I think Mick got five or six. Oh, stop it. (laughs) (laughs) Peter got six. Question one. Nice, easy one. Who was the actor that played Indiana Jones? Harrison Ford. Yeah. I couldn't think of his name then. I've not actually (laughs) wrote the answers down. (laughs) There you go, see? One. I'm not very good with names. I'm not. I'm not. It's from dyslexia. Or memory. Same, my dyslexia. That I had um, piss taken out of me for three years while I was a student. No, you had dyslexia. I <laughs> know, nobody did. That's why... You um, didn't declare it, did you? No, I didn't know. Huh. I didn't know. I only found out when I was on my PGCE. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was only because I kept forgetting this woman's name. And uh, Sarah said, oh, you're going to have to go for a dyslexia test because that can be dyslexia. I went and did it. Well, and maybe that's what I've got instead of Alzheimer's. It might be. Yeah, unless you've just picked, started picking it up recently. I don't think you pick up dyslexia. But you can pick up, like, how old are you? Old enough. <laughs> for, di- for, for Alzheimer's. For Alzheimer's. <laughs> or, no, people get it in their 30s and stuff, though, don't they? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's no joke, that one. What was the surname of Del Boy and Rodney in Only Fools and Horses? I don't know. Never watched it, really. Everybody in the world should know, well, everybody in Britain should know the Del Trotter. Boy. See? You didn't even watch it and you knew it. See, so that's two. Get a little bit more difficult, though. 
What's the atomic weight of a cobalt? <laughs> Sorry, it's Three. Not, I don't know, I have no idea. <laughs> was that a real question? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. What was the first edited film? Oh, um, Life of an American Fire thingy. Fireman. Is it? I think so. I didn't actually put an answer down. I was hoping you'd get it right. <laughs> Was commonly it? commonly known as the first edited film. Right, right. That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go for that. Was he edited to male or female? Why does it matter? I've, it's part of the question. I'm not sure. You get half a point for each. You, of course you're sure. I'm not, well, you're because sure. the, there was a, because I'm not sure that the director was male, but I don't know the director edited it because editing wasn't a job at the time, was it? So I don't know who edited it. I would imagine. It's the director. The director. Yeah, I'll go for that. Yeah, mail. I'll write that in. Question four. What was the character's name played by Michael Douglas in the Wall Street films? I have no idea. No? No. Don't even want to have a guess? No. Right. Who? What was it? Gordon Gecko. Oh, right. Well, yeah, I've never you've seen heard the name, haven't you? I've heard the name, but I wouldn't know. Thing. Right, so we're on three up tonight. It's not bad, it's not bad. Um. Where am I up to? Your character's name. What are the names of the Chuckle Brothers? I don't know that either. Make work with them. Well, that's high quality television for you. That's what I said. Uh, he said it right at the end. I, said, I can't believe he didn't start with it. Like his highlight. Uh, right, so, mm. See, I never worked on shite like that. Chuckle <laughs> Brothers is brilliant. <laughs> They're back on, you know. Great. I know. <laughs> Uh, how many are we on? Three, up to now. Do female editors log footage better because they can turn their brain off quicker? This isn't a question that should have a right or wrong answer because it's just a wind-up question. It's, it's got a right or wrong answer <laughs> on my sheet. <laughs> I don't make the questions. Yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll put you down as a... I'll put your just answer... put me down as correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you down in there. That's four. Four. Industry question now. What is Black Magic? Uh, well, do you mean the company or? Yeah, it's an industry it's, question. It's a company who make various bits and pieces. Like originally they made uh, boards and software and cameras and things like that. Yeah, there you go. See, it's easy. Five. I don't know why you're panicking about this. Five. We're nearly there now. Um, what is a lens? What is a lens? Yeah. It's an optical device that you put on the front of a camera to, you know, converge the images. And it's a good guess. What's the answer then? It's a chicken shop. It's what? It's a chicken shop. In Bolton. Yeah. What's it called? A lens fried chicken. Oh. <laughs> so you're still on five. Like that's I said, not a question. Mick, Mick got five. That's six. He didn't. He got five, you said before. No, I said six. Chuckle Brothers shouldn't Did count. count. <laughs> Do you think it's fair that female editors get paid the same as male editors? Yes. <laughs> that's the correct answer, so that's six. <laughs> Quite often they don't. I'm not sure. On here it says no, because their hands are smaller. So I'm not, I'm not sure whether we should be giving you the... Uh, you should be giving that to me. So number six, all right, fair enough. Lisa gives me stink eye. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's your quiz over. Hang on, I'm sure I'm missing a question, though. Yeah, how could I get... You got six. Out of what, eight? No, it should have been ten. One, two, You're not giving three, me ten questions, four. there. Six, seven, eight. I think I give you nine. I'm gonna have to think of one. Well, on what the I've spot. got wrong? Chuckle Brothers. You got Chuckle Brothers wrong. Gordon Gecko. Gecko. Um, what is a lens? Oh yeah, that's so yeah three nine. What's the last question then? Um, hang on. Just let me check my other document. <laughs> <laughs> Unfairly weighted in favour of the male contestants, that. 
I put in, I wanted an industry question, but Mick couldn't think of any. What industry question did you ask him? No, I said, give me some industry questions to ask Lisa, and he couldn't think of any. Last question. Who played the Prince Regent, Blackadder the Third? Easy one, that. Rowan Atkinson? No, that was Blackadder. Who played Prince Regent? Uh, thingy. Um, Hugh Laurie? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one more than Mick Farr. <laughs> That's seven. Although you did argue your points on two of the questions that shouldn't have been... Um, but they shouldn't have been questions, they were I wrong have to questions. I and just put, call you six. Seven. <laughs> right, so... Before, no, before we wrap up, have you got any advice for advice. As, for aspiring film... Uh, well, not filmmakers, aspiring editors? Um, yeah, learn how to tell a story. Um cut some things so you've got something to show people uh, you see I've always struggled with that were editor show reels well that's the thing I've never really been asked for show reels but when you get when it gets serious they don't ask for a show reel they ask for your last two programs right right so you know show reels don't really always well, mean that much in terms of telling a story let's go off someone that's just left just left university what well, what would you be your advice to them uh, don't be snobby about work because you can't afford to be. So, you know, when I started out, one of my first jobs was cutting an awful corporate video about roofing felt, but I got paid 150 quid to do it. Um, and it taught me things, you know, about what to do with crap camera work and um, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you have to be tenacious. You have to, you know, keep at it and grab any opportunity you can, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Um, Do you think it's harder now, though, in the industry? Like I was saying before, it's more... Well, I think the industry's changing, so I, I think... Diluted. Yeah, possibly. I mean, a lot of the people that I know that have gone into things now are, are very much a one-man or one-person filmmaking thing. So they can yeah. shoot and they can edit and, you know, they, they're making short films. Um I think people that have gone in to making documentary have gone via routes. I mean, I don't, I don't know about editing. I mean, less people seem to be editing for, like, the big firms like Granada, but I still think mm. you need to kind of get in via, um, you know, cutting a few things, getting to know people, um, getting work shown. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's still a case of who you know. Not it is you know. a case of kind of networking, but sometimes it's a case of kind I can't network me. I'm terrible at networking. Events. Well, uh, yeah, I know. It's funny that networking thing. is. It's, it's about being passed along, really, Yeah, I'd say, which is a bit of a crap phrase because it does make you feel like a... Yeah. You know. But if you cut something for somebody and you do it well... Through word of mouth, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then they'll recommend you to someone else. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of how I got from place to place is by, you know... Um, there was a particular director, actually, a couple of particular directors. One guy, Sol, who I'd worked with from really early on, and we'd done little short things with dance stuff, you know, art stuff. Right. And then when he got a bigger commission, he took me into Granada to do that. And so we did that. And then uh, the guy that he was co-directing, it was Warship, um, with took me on to do his 90-minute documentary about the Emperor Vespasian. But the good thing about Tony was that he liked to mentor people, you know, people who were kind of at the beginning of their career. Yeah. Because he was a very experienced director, so he was very good at giving people breaks. Right, right. Uh, so he did that for me and another guy called Ivan. Right. I so, Although I was saying it's more difficult, Some some respects it's easier because you have got these opportunities like Amazon where yeah. you can go out and make your... Like I've done. When I made my own film and... Even if I didn't get the distribution, I could have made sure that it got on Amazon. Yeah. Do you make any money out of that? On the film at the minute? Yeah. No, but it's just getting no players because it's on the... Uh, it's not. You need to get them on the carousel. You know, on but, the I mean, actual... you know, editing, it's hard work and it's about getting paid. 
yeah per yeah, day yeah. for you know the with my, I'm going to use it as a as a reference. As in, yeah. you know, I've had a film that's been distributed through a global distributor, so it's not a bad thing to have, even if I made no money from it. Well, no, absolutely. But then, you know, you you probably would go um, put forward ideas to companies, yeah, or, um, rather than just go in as a kind of job in editor. But if you want yeah, to yeah. work as a job in editor, yeah. then you need to find a way. Um, so when I started my small business, we used to take people on as runners and then they'd start doing bits of editing and that still happens in places like Doc 10. Yeah. So, you know, there's still work going like that and also with all the corporate people like, um, I don't know, they used to be called uh, Mainstream and then they were called something else and they're always changing the name. Right. You know, companies like The Gate Productions. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can if you, if you can get in there, the usual route is via being a runner and showing you're kind of good at being right. technically adept. So your advice would be just just go out and make things, edit things, and sort of try and get. Yeah, and also go and see, find those small companies. I think if you can, so there's a lot of small digital companies. You mm. know, if you can get in there and say, you know, I can do this, I can do that. They'll, but those small companies probably want you to be a bit of an all rounder, like to shoot stuff and edit. Yeah, yeah. So if you want a head for editing, you probably need to do a bit of that, get it under your belt, and then move towards getting recommended to television there's a lot of these small companies though are just what they are it's like the person who's the director the editor the producer like mm. one guy that's decided that he needs a company to pretend that it's a company when really what it is is one guy doing this or female <laughs> doing their own thing do you know what i mean yeah that's true but there are <clears throat> quite a lot of these small you know marketing advertising companies you know if you go up sharp futures are all in those you know uh, what do you call it? Containers. All oh, right, yeah. Um, you know, two or three people just churning over work. It's the sort of thing that Paul Willis has gone to work for. All oh, right, right, right. Um, is he is he in Manchester? Yeah, yeah now so. he's going to Chief, who are kind of quite good. And then you need to find, you know, or you find your way into a company like, um, you know, Blakeway or something like that. Although they do take job in editors on, and they, it's really hard to get involved mm, I'm not, with. I'm those not sure whether they do now. That I know that they, they had one guy who worked in there that was sort of editing the, tasters. you know, like the tasters. Yeah, Yeah, but when they get a full-on programme, they'll take a freelancer. They'll take the best editor they can get for that programme. Right, they right. They won't use their job in editor. Right, right. Necessarily. It's very, very small company. I mean, when you think what they actually produce, well, the one, because Blakeway is a big company that runs mm. all the small divisions of it. Yeah. But it's funny though I mean I just got offered um, The Real Housewives of Cheshire And I don't even know How they got my name but Actually right. they probably got it off um, The day, the North West Editors Guild But <laughs> <laughs> All right the Guild Yeah <laughs> <laughs> But you know there, there does come a time Where everybody's busy You know if there's a lot yeah, of Going yeah. on then So you, you just think Everybody else in the Guild Was busy So they came to you Yeah It's a, it's a big programme that I've never seen it, never want to watch it, but it is a big popular Yeah, program. and again, that's word of mouth, isn't it? That, so yeah. the production managers are also good to talk to because it's probably the production managers who book the editors and they'll have said, oh, God, have you, have you tried? You and know, it, it's got, one of them type of programmes where you, th you will just get a lump of footage, won't you? And they'll want you to mould it in a certain way. Although it, part it, of it, it, it'll it'll have a formula. It it, yeah, it'll yeah. have a kind of style, house style. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, you just watch the house style. And, have, you not, have you not taken it on? No, because I don't want to do six weeks editing over summer. And also, I've got another project on. I tell you what, it's all right, isn't it, for some? Yeah. I'd to like to do it, summer. but I've got a teenage daughter, and, you know, she'll go feral if I just take six weeks off in the summer. <laughs> yeah. Right, <laughs> before we finish, what's for the future? Big plug! The, the um, A few nagging questions is the programme that I'm doing at the moment with Paul Sapin, which is about the shootout in Glenville, Ohio, which happened 50 years ago. And that's kind of, we're looking at, hopefully, Storyville for that. Ah, right, right. So mm. uh, she said she might give us, the, the Storyville woman said she might give us some development. Right. And um, on top of that, there's the new great tapes thing, which I might have some involvement in. I don't think I'll do the final cut. I might what's, do What's the great tapes thing? Uh, the... Black Grape, Sean Ryder oh. documentary. So um, I'm going to hopefully have a bit of a hand in that. Are you going to do that and continue to um, part-time lecture? I mean, sorry, I mean full-time lecturer. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, all the staff are fleeing, aren't they? So somebody's got to steer the boat. <laughs> are you going as well? Not is, your, is your plan go, to go? No, my plan's to stick stick it out. Right, so yeah, thanks. For, I was going to say thanks for coming, but I came to <laughs> you lot again. Um, so say bye to our uh, millions of listeners. Bye, listener. And that's it. You've been listening to a confusing load of bollocks. The views and opinions of any guests are not necessarily that of Custard Room Productions. And if you are offended or do not agree with any of the comments, please take it to Twitter and we'll ignore you, you snowflake. This episode was sponsored by AlexanderDoddy.com for all your voiceover and narration needs. He provides a full professional service, all digitally supplied. Remember to check the show notes for links to any films or social media mentioned throughout. Or if you're thinking of sponsoring the show, please contact me at Custard Room on Twitter. Thanks for listening. I'm